and we're live. Uh, my name is Steve Isaacs. I'm going to be uh, presenting today on Game Maker Studio and why kids should create games. Uh, if for any reason you have any trouble hearing me or anything, you know, just type something in the chat window. It's a, a little bit odd um, presenting without seeing everybody. So uh, any clues uh, to help me out would, would be great. And if you have any questions, uh, I would love to be flexible during the session and answer them when I can, and, and I'm certainly going to try to leave some time at the end. And of course, we'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors, uh, BrainPop, ASB Online Academy, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, and the Learning Revolution Project. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I am so impressed that this has been a free conference with so many great presenters and everything, and uh, we couldn't have done it without the sponsors for sure. All right, this is that fun part where everybody gets to show us where you're from. If you click on, I think it's the little star thing next to the participants, and you can click and then put where we are. Oh, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Oh, there we go. I got a little of sun. I'm going to put myself here on the East Coast. My friend Ribbon just joined. Okay, a lot of U.S. But all over the U.S., that's for sure. There's another one of my students, Bella the Unicorn. Okay. Uh, if, if everybody take one more second to click on the little sun star looking thing under the arrow pointer and show us where you're from and then we'll move on. Uh oh. All right. Here we go. So, um, actually this slide, uh, the word classroom being crossed off, uh, it had a, a nifty uh, word art of the word studio above that and the presentation is uh, game design and development in the studio. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of the word uh, or the, the idea of classrooms as we've all known them. Um, you know, a studio is much more of a conducive learning space to what I'll be talking about, I believe. And on this uh, slide, the resources there, which um, somebody was so nice to, uh, I think it was, oh, who was it? I think it was Peggy. Uh, put them earlier in the chat, the direct links to these. So the, the Bitly has a bunch of great game maker resources, including a uh, sample project that I created with videos to guide you through learning your first game in Game Maker Studio. Uh, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm somewhat prolific on Twitter, at Mr. Isaacs, and I have my blog and email there. By all means, contact me. Uh, one of my goals is to help others you know, start game design programs in their schools as I think there should be a whole lot more of it. And there's me. Um, so a while ago, uh, my wife and I owned a, a computer training and gaming center called Liberty Corner Computing. And I bring that up because while we were there, we were able to, uh, because it was a for-profit business, we could offer, you know, very exciting, innovative, creative programs a lot of which, um, which catered to, you know, game-based learning before I think they had a term called game-based learning. And we did a lot of game design, a lot of, um, you know, game integration with commercial games and things, and it was a really, really a neat environment, and kids then would also come on the weekends and evenings for multiplayer gaming and such. So we also were able to create a great safe space for local kids in a town that didn't have too much going on. Um, and through that and before and to this day, I've been teaching uh, 22, I think I might be in my 23rd year in the classroom. I actually started my career in, in special education in a self-contained class, and then uh, my passion for, for games and technology and, and computers and such uh, got me in this direction. Okay. Uh, I love to, uh, to I, somebody, I stole this idea, somebody at a presentation uh, started their their, their presentation with uh, sharing what they were currently playing. And I think it's really valuable, especially for what I do, because um, for me, any game I play is definitely considered uh, professional development. And right now I'm playing Hearthstone. 
uh, clash of clans. I wonder if any of my clan mates are here. Uh, we have a great clan made up of students and teachers from, it used to be, I'd say, across the country. Now we're across the world with our new presence in New Zealand and Australia. And that's been a really neat environment of playing and learning alongside, you know, the kids. Um, the Wolf Among Us, I just started. And I was a big fan of the Walking Dead uh, Telltale Games um, episodic adventure. And one of the reasons I, I kind of point that out now, too, is the narrative in these games is so incredible. And when it comes to teaching game design, that's one of the elements that definitely um, should be, you know, included. So you know, I kind of like to look at games like that and see how that comes across. And a new game I just started is playing is called Fight the Dragon. And Fight the Dragon, um, I saw it at PAX Prime, and the thing that drew me to it immediately is that all of the, all of the uh, content in the game is essentially being created by users. So it has a, a level editor. It's an RPG with a level editor. And, um, and basically, as it evolves, it's going to be all the adventures are going to be created by users, which I think is fantastic and fits well into my class. And the way they've set it up is pretty neat. So if you get a chance to take a look, it's on Steam, I think, early access right now. So what are you playing? And if you could just chat, chat this up in the little chat room. And you're going to have to, uh, to uh, accept my apology. I'm in a school building, so I didn't think of the fact that you'll hear announcements here and there. It is after school, but hey. But if you could type in what games you're currently playing, I'd love to see. All right, Minecraft. Clash of Clans, Mark Suter. Mm. My buddy Riven, uh, who I have to get back to playing WoW with. The Sim 3 in Minecraft. A lot of Minecraft, which is great. And I love seeing the playing Minecraft with my child and all that. Um, my daughter finally started playing a little bit of Minecraft, and that was a, a very happy day for me. Uh, so hopefully I'll continue that. So, yeah, so again, with me, what I'm playing, you know, I, I, I like to think of it as all, I kind of take a look at it from a design standpoint and all. But anyway, so my, my class, um, I started, and a lot of people start this way, so I'm kind of just trying to set the stage so you can have an idea if you're interested in starting your own program. But like I said, we started like summer camps and after school programs at our uh, private, you know, uh, company. But then when I started teaching at this school, um, we did an after school club here, and that was an easy way to get game design into, into the school. Uh, I started teaching the gifted and talented program, so I saw that as an opportunity to sneak in a unit on game design, and we did a, a unit on board game design as well as digital games. And then now, uh, you know, my vision was always to develop a full semester elective uh, in game design and development, and I have to uh, give a, a real, real nice shout out to my supervisor, um, Brian Heineman, and my principal, Karen Hudock, who at the time, you know, I wanted to, to bring this in, and I was afraid people were going to resist this idea of, of a class on game design, and, and they um, supported it fully from the onset, and it's, you know, grown to be a really fantastic program. And the, as I talk, I hope you, um, you see the, the real great logic as to why teaching game design and development makes a whole lot of sense, but, you know, I was thinking that it was going to be a harder sell, and I'm really grateful that it was, uh, was, was you know, was given uh, a lot of support. Um, so anyway, in, in my class now, um, it's a full semester course. I use 3D Game Lab, which I can talk about separately, uh, another, you know, with whomever would like to offer a whole lot of um, choice in learning through extension activities and such. Um, <laughs> Wei Young wants to know how to take a screenshot so he could prove that he was here. Um, if you hit Alt, Print Screen, that'll copy it to your clipboard, and then you can paste it into an art program, and then you can forward it to me however you'd like. Um, and now, it, so, so my eighth grade class has been really great. And now, in addition to that, we started noticing that when we offered it as an elective to eighth graders, 
and kids just signed up for it based on the course catalog. At first, it was a lot of boys signing up and not that many, many girls, and that was a definite concern. Um, so what we started was we, we, we scaled the curriculum to the seventh grade cycle, so now every seventh grader also takes um, a six-week course in game design and digital storytelling. So it works uh, as a nice um, feeder course to the game design, to the game design and development course in eighth grade. And I'm very happy to report that there are more, there is much more female participation now. It's not a not 50/50, but I'm, I'm pleased that that the it's a noticeable improvement. All right. So my, my classroom, and I'm going to go through a few of these so I can get to showing you a little more with what Game Maker looks like. But basically, my philosophy is that I want the kids to, for the most part, where, where possible, feel like we're working in a studio environment. Um, I like to see myself more as a facilitator than a teacher, um, a partner in learning. I, I'm as eager to learn, well, maybe more eager to learn sometimes than, than my students, but uh, I have a passion for learning all this. Everything I teach is self-taught. Um, so if I'm in a position where I can model that and learn alongside my students, I think, I think we're in good shape. Um, the quest-based idea works out really well with providing opportunities through main quests and side quests to offer a whole lot of uh, different options for, for kids to take the learning path you know, that appeals to them. And collaboration is really big in my class in terms of opportunities to work in teams and design teams make a lot of sense because as we start going, kids notice they have different interests uh, from one another. Some might start to gravitate towards graphic design and animation and that's fine. Some like, uh, some might, you know, be more into the coding side, the sound side and all that. And then we do a lot of um, iteration with peer evaluation and such so that the kids, you know, really can help each other by evaluating the games and, and providing feedback. Okay, so why is game design and development important? And actually, I'd love for any of my students to point out anything that they find so far just as a, you know, as their feelings as, as we go through the presentation. But okay, so I'm a big fan of, of Seymour Papert and nowadays the maker movement and such. Um, you know, I believe kids need to, to be able to construct and build and create. Uh, and as, as this quote is great, it says, children don't get ideas, they make ideas. Better learning will not come from finding better ways for the teacher to instruct, but from giving the learner better opportunities to construct. So, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, basically, uh, I could probably say that, uh, you know, Seymour Papert, Anything he says or said or, or did, uh, I, I agree with entirely and, and appreciate all of his contributions. So these are some of the things, too, you want to consider. When One of the things that's neat about game design for middle schoolers is this idea that they're actually, well, it's a very authentic pro process. They're designing for an audience, it's as if they're designing for, the, for a client. So middle schoolers do not have an easy time with this. Uh, they tend to and no offense to any of my, my students here, they tend to have a great idea for what uh, their game might be, you know, in terms of them as the designer, they know what should happen, they know what they think the player should be doing, they have their idea, and then all of a sudden when another person starts playing their game, it becomes very revealing that, that they have to actually have empathy towards what somebody else's experience is, and it might be a little different. Um, the iterative design process is, is a tremendous uh, opportunity that comes in a class like this. Um, throughout every activity we do, the kids first have to have to design their game, so they come up with like essentially a design document. They then um, then they then start to develop their game. They uh, you know, and then after part of the developing process, we start play testing each other's games and the evaluation and conference model where somebody else plays their game and then shares feedback in, again, spirit is always to try to help the person they're working with make their game better. Um, and then there's the refinement, and this cycle continues several times for every project that we do. Um, another thing, too, that I always have the kids do, which I think is a great activity, is that um, 
the uh, what do you call it? Um, so when when a, when a kid has somebody else playing their game, I have the designer sit back and have to, which is very difficult for them, not say a word and not guide the player at all and just watch the other person play their game, which is incredibly telling. Um, you know, they want to they want to tell you what you should do, what you're supposed to do, and I have to remind them constantly that, you know, well, for one, I've never bought a game. I like this little joke. I say it a lot. But I never, I've never bought a game and had GameStop send the designer home with me to help me play the game. So, you know, I have to remind the kids of this, and, and it's very interesting for them to really get that empathy and watch what somebody else is playing. Their inclination is to walk around and watch somebody else do something. So to stay and actually watch somebody play your game is a, a pretty, pretty incredible uh, part of the process. Just to show a little bit about some of the design planning, for a lot of the activities it will include, you know, a sketch. So on the left there is a sketch of a level for Portal 2, and on the right is a sketch of a game controller a student designed using the Makey Makey. And uh, what was kind of neat about this is the, he didn't want you to see the actual Makey Makey hardware, so he created a box where the Makey Makey would be inside the box and then it would, would function, um, you know, seamlessly without seeing, you know, that hardware. Uh, collaboration and, and the interdisciplinary approach is great. This, I thought this was cool. So about a number of years ago, I just kind of as I was searching online, I found this graphic, but I believe it came from this course that was, I think, from 2009 at the College of New Jersey and Villanova. And they were pitching this idea of an innovative open studio approach to game development, um, you know, between these two schools. And, and it talked a lot about how this process, which is what I instill, you know, in, in my kids, is that the brainstorming part of a game, you know, everybody's involved in. Um, you know, writing the, then there's the writing the story. There's so many different facets to the collaborative process where, again, if, if we allow kids to, um, if we allow kids to, you know, to find their way and not insist that every kid learns the same thing in a class, I think we, we really can open up the possibilities. Um, I've noticed quite a bit that kids come in thinking they're very interested in game design, but they don't know what really maybe what certain aspects are, and come out being really great with designing pixel art, and then they end up being on a design team where that's their primary role, uh, which is completely appropriate. So, you know, I think we have to move away sometimes from thinking everyone has to come out with the same, you know, learning goals. And uh, the computer science skills. I, right now, you know, we hear so much about code.org and the hour of code and, and how um, some schools are starting to accept computer science as a foreign language. Um, it's whether or not kids are going to go into computer science is not really the point, but everybody should have some understanding of how computers and how program, programming works. Um, Game Maker, which I'm going to now show you some kind of examples of, do this in, I think, a, a fantastic way. So I'm going to just show you a couple of slides. Like Game Maker, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to, with time permitting, I want to show a little demo as well. But here's just an example of, of using Game Maker to, to understand a concept like conditional statements like if then. Right now I have this situation where my player um, is, if he, when he collides with a door, we're going to check if the next room exists, then go to the next room, okay? And the idea, very simple in structure, but it looks like it would in a programming language, but yet it's graphical. Kids are choosing actions from here. They're choosing their events. Um, do you see my little cursor moving? Because I'm pointing at things. I just hope it makes sense. But uh, so anyway, um, so and, and what I do see, see these blocks here. There, that kind of indicates like the curly brackets that you would use in a programming language and that kind of thing. So I guess we can't see my uh, my uh, cursor moving, but you get the idea. So moving along in this idea. Um, we can also use variables and teach variables. So in this game maker example, my player, when he's created, we're setting or declaring a variable like you would in any programming language, 
and I'm declaring a variable called has key. I'm giving it a value of zero. And if you see in the action side, it put that result there. So there's a variable here with a value of zero. Um, the reason being, the kids have to understand first, they have to declare a variable. And then when something happens, we can change the value of the variable. So when that same player collides with the key, that variable has key is going to change to one. So now we went from not having the key, which is, was in this case zero, which represents false, to having the key, which represents, you know, is one, which represents true. And then we're going to test the variable to see if we can, you know, open this lock. So now my player, when he collides with this lock, we're going to test if this variable has key is equal to one, then we're going to destroy the instance of the lock. Okay? So hopefully that's all making sense. Um, I'm not seeing what's going on in the chat, so if there are any, like, real questions or anything, please raise your hand with the little raise hand icon that you'll see under your name. Um, and hopefully I would see that. Okay, another thing that we can teach really well with GameMaker is the idea of loops. So in this case, and these are three different things that I just wanted to show in the one slide. So in this case, I said when my player is created, we're going to set a variable can shoot, if you see that arrow over there, to one. So in other words, when he's created, he technically can shoot, you know, at least by the way I'm going to define that, I'm considering that true. When my player presses the space bar, we're going to do another conditional statement, if can shoot is equal to one, then we're going to create a moving instance of, in this case, a burger. My kids from class today know because we shot cheeseburgers. Apparently it's National Cheeseburger Day, and uh, one of my students pointed out, and in our game, the demo game that I'm doing, it's called Escape from Alcatraz, and the the uh, criminal um, who was wrongly accused, or so we think, is trying to escape, and there are guards everywhere, and he throws cheeseburgers at them to try to um, distract them. And it worked pretty well, and, and then he was able to get away. Um, so if the variable can shoot as one, we'll create this moving instance of object burger. Then, in this case, I'm setting the variable back to zero, so he then cannot shoot, at least for the moment. And then I'm setting an alarm. This is to show you the idea of loops. So I'm setting an alarm to 30 steps, which in GameMaker is um, about a second. So then, in another event, I'm setting that when I'm saying when the alarm goes off, we're going to set this variable can shoot back to one. So this restarts the loop. So in other words, now it's back to one. He presses spacebar again. If it's one, he can shoot. It sets back to zero. There's a pause, etc. You get the idea? Hope so. Um, wait, chocolate milkshake day. Um, and free donut day. Coffee day is coming up too, I think. Oh, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> um, so, and just to move on to allow, about some other things we can accomplish with things like GameMaker, um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, you know, sprite design and animation, and, and GameMaker has a really great um, sprite editor that you can also create frame animation in, and then your characters take on that animation, you know, as they move based on the steps that I mentioned, you know, in GameMaker. Each step, they'll change their, their the costume, and, and it'll keep going. Um, and so they can do um, uh, graphic design and animation right within GameMaker, which I think is fantastic. And now, um, another thing we deal with is uh, kids can, can work on sound engineering using Audacity. So again, it's another whole skill that kids might choose to engage in. Um, where they decide that they want to, uh, or not that they want, I mean, they might You just, well, everybody's going to add sound. Some of them are going to edit their own sounds and things like that. We also started something really neat in my school, and I don't know if um, he might be in the chat, but there's a, a teacher I work with, uh, Mark Fabio is his name, and he has a class called Creating Music, and his students, we started a couple years ago, um, they'll collaborate with my kids. They'll find out, they'll get the game design documents and a little uh, prototype of the game, and then the kids in the creating music class will create uh, music for the games, and then my kids will then, in turn, put those, that music in. So it's kind of neat to work with, you know, cross-class. I'd love to bring in even more with the art teachers and 
have kids learn, you know, real graphic design and such. And a step further, if we could work with like some of the language arts teachers, you know, how great would it be if the storylines were uh, were were managed by a, a better writer than I? So pretty neat stuff. And uh, my kids are probably just soon going to really start enjoying the beauty of debugging um, code. So when you know uh, anyone who's done some programming, I guess has probably somewhat of a love-hate relationship with debugging. Um, uh, do I still do the thing with the music? Yes, we do, Emilio. So Mr. Fabio, uh, some of his kids might be creating music for us. Um, so, so anyway, so with the debugging, you know, we're gonna you run into errors all the time with programming. Um, kids tend to think that that the program has a bug, and then quickly we realize um, there's a little human error involved. And when they uh, you know, so going through that process is, is awesome. It's, it's an authentic problem. You know, it's funny too. I gave, when I was at PAX Prime, we gave a presentation on, on the value of failure um, and, you know, and, and why failure is important. And failure is so inherent in game playing and game design, yet we don't necessarily call it failure or think of it like we've, you know, failed. Rather, we have a problem, we solve it, and we move on. Um, and my, you know, one of my big, uh, sort of soapbox items is the idea that, you know, we need to embrace, you know, failure and unfortunately failure over time has gotten a, a bad rap and uh, sort of has become synonymous with, with, with failing, uh, unfortunately. But anyway, um, so moving right along. The other, one of the other things that's fantastic about game design is the cultural capital or agency, um, you know, you know, kids are, are we're, we're meeting them where their passion lies, you know, um, and what better way to engage and excite students about learning, I would think, you know. So that's a big piece. Um, another thing I, I kind of like to bring up is sort of this stealth schooling idea. Um, it's the whole, like, you know, kids are, kids, well, especially with something like Game Maker, anybody who's used it, Kids are learning really great programming skills, but they're not, they're not in that position where it's um, something really intimidating. So they're learning the concepts in a very engaging, concrete, logical way. So, um, so you know, basically, you know, they're, we're, we're hitting them in, in an area they're interested in where, you know, it's that whole uh, the fishing analogy, landing the fish would be mastery for the child. We let them move on to be fascinated by some other enticing concept or use of the knowledge to scaffold to the next higher level. They move on with greater knowledge and experience to build upon what they know. And this all kind of evolves naturally, which is really fantastic. Um, one of the other things uh, is, and this is one of my goals, is that we have an opportunity here to, to really scale the learning. And there are so many great products, most of which are free, Oh, and that's a qu let me just touch on that question real quick. Uh, do you need to have a lot of game playing experience before you try to build or design a game? Um, that's interesting because I would say not necessarily, um, but it certainly helps. I guess if nothing else, what I would have kids do uh, if they haven't played much is have them start playing more, uh, and we can go that route. Uh, it's you know, who knows? I mean, too sometimes maybe you'll have a student who, because they're not, don't have all these preconceptions of what every, what type of game is out there, maybe they'll come up with a new, you know, genre or something. Um, but anyway, so Game Maker, Game Store Mechanic I use with my seventh graders. You could use that even with younger kids. Scratch you can use right from elementary school and it's great. Um, you know, Game Maker I think is just the perfect, like, middle school and up uh, program because with, with Game Maker, what I've been teaching the kids mostly deals with the drag and drop fun functionality, but there's a whole uh, language, game maker language behind it that students um, can embrace and get into. And some do that on their own. Some, you know, you know, some classes, especially on the high school level, can focus on that and such. And then uh, this is a picture here. The ball looking thing is something called Agent Cubes, which is um, so a 3D. Uh, you know, continuation of what was Agent Sheets. And Agent Cubes is a really neat 3D environment that uh, 
I took a workshop once, and in about an hour or so, we created our own Frogger game. So it's definitely um, something, you know, that's reasonably easy point of entry. Uh, game Salad, some people might have heard of. And then Unity is, um, you know, Unity is even these days becoming apparently easier to introduce at younger levels, which is great. Um, great for building environments. The opportunity for coding and creating really high-end games is definitely definitely there. Um, I haven't. I, I I want to learn more Unity myself, uh, and maybe I'll do that with some of my students when we get a chance. Uh, just to go through a little too, we use. I mentioned uh, the Quest-based learning environment. Um, I use 3D Game Lab. 3D Game Lab has us uh, allows you to you know, set up quests, give experience points for completing the quests, and um, the kids, you know, in, in my case, their grade, because I still have to kind of give a grade, um, comes from something we establish as a benchmark for how many experience points each level would be and what grades would go with that. So, um, and again, this is where I love the fact that because of this environment, when something kind of cool enters the picture, like I shared that game Fight the Dragon earlier. Well, now I'm really excited to add some quests about Fight the Dragon to let kids experience that and create their own, um, their own, uh, you know, levels in that and then to expand upon that as possibilities. So, you know, every new little thing that comes in can at least open up a possibility for different kids that are interested and such. And a lot of times the kids, um, you know, I mean, I'm open to a kid having an idea for a, for a quest line, and we could build it together, quite honestly. And in fact, uh, well, I'll get to this when I talk a little bit about some side quests. Um, just to give you an idea of my curriculum, this is kind of what the quest line map looks like for the quests in 3D Game Lab. I know you can't really see it, but all of these represent different quest lines. So, um, you know, some of them have side quests right off of them. Some of the side quests stand on their own, and stuff like that. And so in my class, the main quest lines, we do a project with Game Maker Studio, uh, which we're doing right now. We do, this is in my eighth grade class, we do a unit in Minecraft where, where the kids essentially uh, create their own game in Minecraft. Um, and this is one that I don't know if, uh, if No Clue is still here, but, you know, she was very instrumental in my understanding. Um, about you know really embracing uh, student you know student driven and student you know student driven learning. Uh, when I first started thinking about Minecraft, in my mind, it was like, well, I can envision doing you know an adventure game or an adventure map because that made sense. And then as I started getting a better understanding, it made a lot more sense that I should not be the one um, you know narrowing what kind of game the kids should make. So. We've gotten to a point where the kids can create any uh, game they can come up with in Minecraft, and they could work in teams as small or as large as they like. Because Minecraft is one of is one of the few games they can actually be working on at the same time, and everybody seems to be fully engaged and motivated. So it's not one of the programs where I'm worried about kids slacking off and having other kids do all their work because they're they're pretty engaged, you know. Um, and then in Portal 2, we do a unit where we create our own levels. Uh, so that, that, that unit's a lot of fun. The level editor in, um, in Portal 2 is, is awesome. It's pretty easy to, to create levels, and then immediately they're rendered in the beautiful 3D portal environment. So it's pretty great. And a, a quest line, Peggy, uh, <laughs> and Emilio's ready for the Minecraft unit now. Um, a quest line meaning that for Game Maker Studio, there's a project that has many small quests that deal with each quest kind of has the kids um, build on the next, and, and they get experience points for each one they complete. So as they're building their game, there are certain quests that they complete to demonstrate that they have learned certain things. And then when they create their design document, that serves as a quest. When they create their... their um, uh, their game in progress, that's a quest. And then their final game, if they complete it to the point of it being publishable, that's a quest. Um, so, you know, so that's how that kind of goes. But then my side quests, and there are a lot of these, um, 
Yeah, Peggy, that's what I was showing with the, the mind map. It was just kind of showing an outline of for each, each of those strands was a different set of, you know, a number of quests they could have done. Um, but for side quests, uh, again, I like to offer a lot of variety. What happens in my class is typically we're working on the main quest in class. And the side quests, there's sometimes they could work on them at home, I mean in class, and most of the time they're choosing to do those at home. But last year we got a grant um, called Empowering Learners in the Maker Age where we received, um, well, we chose to get uh, a Raspberry Pi, an Xbox One to use Project Spark, the Ouya um, console because it, it, fun it runs on Android and is meant for indie development. So my kids could take their Game Maker games, um, could, you know, code for the controller to work and then port that over to, um, you know, to the, the Ouya, which is really cool. And I have a side quest where they can create a, a text-based adventure. Um, we also purchased a number of Makey Makeys and some other cool things. Uh, so we've been, you know, so those are all available to the kids there. My idea is, you know, let me put the technology in the hands of the students and see what they come up with, you know. So there we go. Um, this slide I just love to show mainly because this is a, this game, and maybe you should write it down, it's called Aeromania, and it's free. And this was created by one of my students last year, um, and he, on his own, went ahead and, uh, and published it to, to uh, iOS, you know, to the Apple Store and the Android Store. And for that, he ended up having to get the, all of the, like there's a, a master collection for Game Maker Studio. Game Maker Studio standard, I should point out, is completely free. That used to be $50, and there used to be a limited free version. So the full version where you can create anything, you know, and everything is free. Um, the part you would then pay for if you are so inclined is the different modules that let you publish to different devices and different um, environments. So to publish to iOS there is an extra fee to publish to Android, et cetera. So this kid went ahead, got all that because he wanted to put his games, you know, on in the Apple Store and then also went through Apple's process of being able to publish on, you know, for for the for iOS and, and he got his game published and it's it's pretty great. So check it out. And this uh, I like to point out too, I don't know if Mark Suter is still on. I hope he is. Um, Mark and I have been working with the the people at Yo-Yo Games. Um, and what we kind of pitched a while back was that we wanted to, they didn't really have much of an educational section or, or um, much in terms of, of resources for people learning Game Maker. So hey Mark, so, so Mark and I um, have been, you know, have taken on the task um, of, of curating and creating content for this, for this page. So yoyogames.com slash learn, um, the tutorials, a lot of those uh, we had both created. The project section, uh, which is mostly managed by Mark, is, is really awesome because it's project-based um, examples. So if kids want to learn, I, I put my Escape from Alcatraz game in there in the beginner category. There's um, Sean Spaulding, who's a, a, a developer that, you know, has a lot of great videos. He put together a platform game uh, example for us on there. We have an RPG example there. And the way those are structured, which is fantastic, is that they all have a uh, playlist of YouTube videos. And the videos take you through all the steps. And then there are even uh, project files along the way that if there's, you know, there are certain checkpoints where you could download part of it to check out, you know, the, the assets and, and what you need to make that part happen. Um, and so forth. So we're really proud of and working on expanding that page. Um, and if anybody out there is, uh, you know, particularly interested in developing content for the page, we'd love to talk to you. Um, definitely tutorials, lesson plans, that sort of thing. And that is my final slide. Um, I'm happy to field questions. I'm also happy to show a little, um, you know, demo in Game Maker, but Let's take a minute for, for questions and see. Uh, is there any? Let's see. 
Yes, lesson plans, lesson plans. <laughs> um, is there any other type of games you could create on Game Maker? Yeah, Wang, there's, gosh, it's almost like the sky's the limit in a sense, but a lot of the games, you know, um, platform games are big. Adventure type games like we're creating now are pretty big. Side scrolling like shooters are, are real popular. Um, the RPG uh, that the that the person um, did those tutorials, those are really great. And then really anything you could think of. Um, I've had kids make pretty cool puzzle games. Um, and you know anybody else chime in? But I think they're I think you know game makers are so open ended that that you know. I'd hate to limit your thinking in any way. Any other questions that I might have missed now that I'm paying a little better attention? How do I screenshot? Um, I think somebody said you can actually save a copy of a slide right from here. But if you want to take a screenshot, you can hit Alt, Print Screen. Print Screens uh, should be next to the F12 key. And then that copies it to your clipboard, and you can paste that. But actually, Michaela. I know you were here. Don't you worry if that's if that's what you're thinking about. Um, and let's see, game income examples. Yeah, the showcase is great. I was, um, you know, I guess I'll mention my my trip to PAX again. But there was a game the guy was demoing there, um, which was really cool. It was called Spoiler Alert, and that's like on Steam for like 2.99, I think. And Carol, you're hired. Um, so the so this game Spoiler Alert, check it out. It at the start of the game, you basically finish the game. And then it starts you going backwards to undo everything you did in the game. So if you collected a star, you have to, you know, end up kind of putting it back. And if you, um, you know, if you destroyed a monster, you have to undestroy it. But it's, it's kind of really cool the way it goes back through the whole game. Um, and there are a lot of other commercial games that have been created with Game Maker. Do you know if there are any other things to create an online game? Um, well, Emilio, that thing I was talking about, like Fight the Dragon, I know we can do some stuff with that. You can create multiplayer games in Game Maker. It's a little bit of a challenge. Um, but as far as other online games, there are online, there are programs online to create games. Creating an online game, uh, I'm not sure of what I'd point you to right at the moment. Hi, Bella. Can we make vehicles? Um, you could definitely have like vehicles that you control in your game maker games, absolutely. Um, having to make more complex looking images and characters. Well, the sprite editor is one way. If you're good with graphics, you can use just about any graphic program and bring the images in. Um, if you're talking more like 3D and stuff, we probably want to move towards something like Unity um, in terms of the environment. But for game maker, I mean, I've seen some pretty great graphics created for Game Maker. Where is the clipboard? The clipboard is like this magic thing that it just copies things to on your computer. So that so if it's on your clipboard, then you can just paste it anywhere, like into Microsoft Word or or Paint. Um, can you can I can I can you play games with others uh, players in Game Maker? Yeah again, there is a way to create online games and there are tutorials for that. It's a little, like I said, it's a little more complex, or a lot more complex, but it can be done. Um, and again, I'm going to tout that Fight the Dragon, because those, that, once you create stuff, you can all play together online. Yeah, you can throw cars and stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's, they do want the screenshot for that reason, Peggy, and I'm going to remember most of them were here. Oh, man, playing Mondo, um, that is, uh, that's a product for creating a um, a location-based game. So yeah, that's an online game. Um, you could totally create. I don't know if anybody plays Ingress. Um, I always think of that when I think of of that type of game. But it's a location-based game. And playing Mondo, um, I, I'd love for you to see. Uh, maybe we'll have no clue. Uh, chat with our class one day about the the experience her students had creating a location-based game based on their school. Um, sixth grade. Ha, when we'll be able to use the Raspberry Pi? Uh, any day during lunch at this point. Um, playing Mondo, yes. 
Oh, boy. Can you make more complex sprites and or weapons? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's one of those things that's going to, you know, you'll start to evolve with your skills as well. Um, let's say so many things here. Um, yes, I think it would be great to have no clue chat with our class. What do you think, no clue? Da 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 da. -da. Hi, I am far behind. Oh, there we go. It got to the end. Okay. So, um, and thank you. Thank you, no clue. Um, that would be awesome. And any other questions? Um, what I could do, like I had said, is I'll show a quick demo of Game Maker, which will have me try my best to share my screen. Let's see if that'll really work. I'm not, let's see. So, share screen, probably under tools, application sharing. Share entire desktop. I'll go that route for the moment. And do you see, and I won't know, wait, can you see, can somebody chime in with, with putting their microphone on for a second? Can you see what I'm showing in Game Maker now? Let's see if I can get back to that. Hmm. Steve, are you trying to desktop That's share? Working, wait. Okay, here we go. So you still see the slides. So you're not seeing Game Maker, huh? Did you do the app share at the Let's top see middle? What I'm doing wrong. No. Okay, that's a problem. So I was showing. I thought I was showing the screen. Application sharing. Let me stop sharing for a minute. Application sharing. Start sharing. Starting. Okay, maybe that'll down. work. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's see if this will work. How about now? Do you see it now? Good. Okay. So this is Game Maker, and this is a, a version of a game that I use a lot for a demo um, called Escape from Alcatraz. And when you look at the resources I, I provided, there's um, the opportunity to download this particular file, which is Alcatraz with missing parts. So you'd have to do some things on your own. So in this case, what I did is Here's, all right, so in, in Game Maker, you have something called sprites, which are basically just the pictures you're going to use to represent things in the game. And then objects, which are where you can do the programming. So it looks kind of similar to what I have in my sprites and my objects. But remember, the sprites are just like the database of pictures. Um, the objects are what I can program. So I have my guy named Bilbo here, and I have him programmed to do a few things. So I have him programmed to move left when I press the left arrow. and here, under move, this was dragged in, and I said he could move left at a speed of five. Same thing for right, except moving right. So now, just to show you how that works, and then I'll show you him move in the game, if I add an event, like keyboard, up, and I tell him, using this move block, to move up at a speed of five, that he's going to hopefully move up when I press the keyboard. Now, the neat thing about it, in my mind, is certain programs, you know, um, don't allow, don't require that you program everything. Like characters could be pre-programmed. In Game Maker, you have to tell it to do everything. So when I'm teaching it, a lot of times the kids are thinking that it's going to automatically stop if it hits a wall. Well, it's not unless I tell it to. So I'm going to add another event: keyboard down, and I'm going to have him go down at a speed of five. Okay, now here's the moment of truth because when I go to play this game, it's going to open something else which makes me question whether you'll see it, but we'll figure that out in a minute. Do you see a screen now that says made with Game Maker? Do you see my, my game or not really? Do you see my, my guards moving around? No. Okay, I've got to fix that. So let me go back here to see if I can change this sharing to be. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to go back to application sharing, share entire desktop, and then hit OK. And then now it should, now do you see it? Oh, great. OK, so there's my awesome game. So my guy now, because I told him to, he moves left, right, up, and down. I also told him to, oh, no, I didn't. I didn't tell him how to stop yet, so he's just moving until I do something. He does stop at walls, because I guess at this point I got him to that far. but. I have to um, tell him what to do. Oh, you know what? Certain ones were stopping, certain weren't. So I told him that when I release left, 
or release right, he should stop moving. Now, there are so many different ways to do this. For a logical reason, you know, to show it in a logical format, I usually show this way first, but there are more efficient ways. But when I release the left key, I'm going to have him keep moving left, but at a speed of zero. And any of my students now can tell you why I'm still having him move to the left, even though he's going at a speed of zero. So I'm, I'm going to make them do that. I'm not even going to tell you exactly why. So we've got that. Now, I need to tell it also that when I release right, no, I already have that one. When I key release up, he's going to also go, at a, go up, but at a speed of zero. And when I key release down, he's going to go down at a speed of zero. So hopefully one of my students shared the why we're going in the same direction, did they? I'll let them do that still. Otherwise, maybe you kind of can understand. Um, but I want to leave that to them unless they don't answer, and then I'll answer it at the end if you're dying to know. Um, so now I did program it that when my guy hits a wall, and this is a little interesting, he now is going to keep going in direction, what's called direction, at a speed of zero. And again, I think my students could tell you why he's, why I'm using this word direction instead of something else, okay? Um, and again, if they don't a a answer, you could always email me and I'll tell you. Um, so we've got that. So now, there are, another thing I showed you before was that whole idea of getting the key. So right now, when I play my game, the, the key, there's nothing programmed for the guy or the key. So I'm going to show you this, and then we'll kind of wrap it up just so you get a little sense of how some of this works. But I'm going to add an event for my character that when he's created, now these tabs are all different types of actions I could use. Under control is all the stuff related to variables. So I'm going to create a variable called has key. And right now he does not have the key, so the variable, the value is zero. Okay? However, when he collides with the key, and this is kind of a spoiler for my students because we didn't get this far in class, when, when we collide with the key, now we're going to set the variable has key to 1 because he has the key. And then finally, we want to think about, uh, oh, you know what else we want to do? When he collides with the key, we also want to destroy the instance of the key. And that would be other. So in other words, self in this case is the character. Other is the thing that I'm interacting with. And the reason we want to destroy it is otherwise you'll walk right over it. Even though you technically have it, it'll look like it's still there, which would not give the illusion that you have it. So I hit OK. Uh, or do I want to do that yet? Um, the other thing I want to do now is if he has the key, I want to unlock the door. So I'm going to just set that real quick. When he collides with the lock, this is where we first check, does he have the key? So is, has, key equal to 1? And if it is, then to make it real simple, we're going to destroy the lock. And this would be, again, other, because I don't want to destroy Bilbo, which you probably will do at times and wonder why you hit the lock and your guy disappeared. Um, and you'll think it's Game Maker's fault. Uh, so anyway, where was I? So I've got that, and then when I finally, let's see if I have more than one room here. I do. So when I finally um, collide with the door, I can just go to the next room because, and the room stuff is down here. Now, the reason I can just go to the next room if I collide with the door is because I can't get to the door, I don't think, unless I get... Uh, See how the door is blocked by the two locks? So now for my grand finale, and I'll take any last questions and bid everybody a fond rest of your gaming in ed day. Um, let's see if this works. So I'm going to play my game. And here we go. So now if I go to the, I'm going to do this, let's see, I'm going to go all the way to my lock and hopefully I can't open it right now without having the key. 
a lot of times when I test things in a game, I will move things closer so I'm not going all around the screen. Oh, do I, and I don't have my hamburgers yet to shoot because in this version I don't have them. Oh, and you know what? I can't get through there anyway. So I knew that was going to happen. So this is a, an example my students will all attest to having this, right? When you sometimes, since my character is the same size as my walls and there's just that little spot for him to go through, he's kind of getting caught and not going through. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, construction work here. I'm gonna actually, no, actually what I'm really going to do is I'm going to move the door here, uh, here, and I'm going to put a bunch of locks here, 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 and I'm going to put a key. Again, this is for testing purposes only. Um, if I was more interested in fixing the issue I had before, I would delete a lot of these blocks so I can get through. Okay. So now I'm just going to play it one last time. I just want to have that feeling of success that I can actually show you that I can get through the door. And Okay, I have the key. I go over here. I can unlock the doors, and there we are in uh, in the Nether. So anyway, that's just a quick example. Um, my resources, please help yourself to them. Um, please don't hesitate to um, to get in touch with me if you have any questions. I would love nothing more than to help guide you on the right path to getting um, some you know, to getting a program set up in your school, as I think it's very valuable. Be happy to talk to anyone at your um, school if that would help and whatnot. Um, and let's see, sign blocks, we'll get to that. Gone fishing and just need a go. <laughs> That's funny. So my Twitter handle, I'll throw that back in here. Uh, it was really a pleasure. I, I hope that that was informative and all of that. Um, and, you know, hope to be in touch with all of you beyond this hour that we were able to spend together. So thanks, Peggy. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would love to deal with, you know, have any kind of mentor type program. That would also always be awesome. Are you doing a presentation again sometime? <laughs> I, I've been presenting a lot, Emilio. Uh, sometimes they haven't been online like this, but uh, I will keep you informed. Thank you. And everybody, again, thanks. And thanks to all my, my students, especially, who, who made it in. And I, I hope, I hope, I hope that um, they were able to provide some, some insight. You know, the student perspective uh, is something you can't beat. Uh, they can share certain things way better than I um, and, you know, really give context. So, again, thank you. And I'll catch you all another time. Thanks, Carol. <laughs>